وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله الذي شرح صدور أهل الإسلام للهدى ونكت في قلوب أهل الطغيان فلا تعي الحكمة أبدا وشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له إلها أحدا فردا صمدا لم يتخذ صاحبة ولا ولدا وشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله ما أعظمه عبدا وسيدا وأكرمه أصلا ومحتدا وأبهره صدرا ومولدا وأطهره مضجعا ومولدا صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه غيوث الندى وليوث العدا صلاة وسلاما دائمين من اليوم إلى أن يبعث الناس غدا أما بعد My beloved brothers and sisters Inshallah ta'ala I want to start a series a 12 part series where I talk about the da'wah of Al-Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab The da'wah of Al-Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab has become a controversial issue Many are speaking about it. Many are discussing it. And each person, based on whatever they have, their preconceived notion, their belief, their upbringing, they've reached a conclusion regarding this imam. Some for him and some against him. So it's at a time like this that the life of this man, what his da'wah was built upon, should be discussed and spoken about. I bi'idhnillahi al-kareem want to speak about the reality of his da'wah in 12 parts. But before I start those 12 parts, or before I go into the topic at hand, I want to start with a muqaddimah tamhidiyah, an introduction. This introduction allows me then to bi'idhnillahi al-kareem go into the topic at hand. And Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, his da'wah al-islahiyyah, this da'wah of his, in which he wanted to revive the misconceptions and the mistakes that people have fallen into. He was aided in this da'wah of his, and he was supported by the Amir Muhammad ibn Su'ud. And this da'wah of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, it spread around the world. It spread first of all in the Arabian Peninsula, and then it spread to the neighboring countries, and then it spread around the globe. Some people became happy with this da'wah, and they were pleased with his da'wah, and others became saddened and hurt and upset with his da'wah. And we'll see why this was the case, and what was the reason of many who supported him and those who spoke against his da'wah. But what I want to say is, any da'wah that stands on two things becomes generally successful and it spreads. Those two things are kitabun hadi, a scripture, a revelation that guides. Wasayfun nasirun, and constitutions to execute that revelation. There has to be a system, a government that's able to execute, that is able to fulfill what is in that scripture, what is in that revelation. Any da'wah that receives those two becomes successful and it spreads around the world. If you look at the da'wah of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, without a doubt he had support or oh, he had the revelation, he had the Qur'an and he had the Sunnah, Rahimahullah. But he didn't have a government that aided him and supported him. The same with Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. He had the revelation, he had the Qur'an and he had the Sunnah. But he didn't have a government to back him and to support him and to aid him. Like in Shaykh al-Islam, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, he had that. He had a kitab hadi. He had the Quran and the Sunnah with him. And he also had a government that was able to 
execute was in the Quran and the Sunnah. Ibn Taymiyyah said in his Kitab al Fatah al Kubra, the fifth volume, page 115, he said, The religion will never be established, or the religion can't be established. إلا بالكتاب والميزان والحديد. شيخ الإسلام ابن تيمية mentioned three things: the book, and i.e. the book here refers to the Quran and the Sunnah. It refers to the book of Allah عز وجل and the prophetic tradition. والميزان and the scale. The scale here is referring to the fitrah, the natural disposition, the natural disposition. That when the Quran and the Sunnah comes, it goes hand in hand with the fitrah. فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ حَنِيفًا فِطْرَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي فَطَرَ النَّاسَ عَلَيْهَا لَا تَبَدِيلَ لِخَلْقِ اللَّهِ ذَلِكَ الدِّينُ الْقَيِّمُ وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ That the Quran and the Sunnah, they go in line with this fitrah, this innate ability. The third which is, والحديد. The hadid here means, which is the third, it's referring to a government that can execute and exercise that which is in the Quran and the Sunnah. Or else it just becomes theories. But the government and the system puts these laws into practice. Shaykh al Islam Taymiyyah he says, Walay yaqum ad dinu the religion will not be established except with these three. Kitabun Yahdi wa hadidun yansur. And he got it, got it from the ayah where Allah said. لَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُلَنَا بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ وَأَنزَلْنَا مَعْهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْمِيزَانَ لِيَقُومَ النَّاسُ بِالْقِسْطِ وَأَنزَلْنَا الْحَدِيدَ فِيهِ بَأْسٌ شَدِيدٌ وَمَنَافِعُ لِلنَّاسِ Shaykh Al-Islam Taymiyyah then said after that فَالْكِتَابُ بِهِ يَقُومُ الْعِلْمُ وَالدِّينِ وَالْمِيزَانُ بِهِ تَقُومُ الْحُقُوقُ فِي الْعُقُودِ الْمَالِكِيَّةِ those three, when it's intact and it's found, then the religion can be established completely. The religion will fully establish tamam al qiyam. That's the first point that I wanted to mention in the introduction. The second thing that I wanted to mention in the introduction is the truth, la budda lahum min a'da. The truth, it is inevitable. It's a reality that the truth will always have enemy. They'll always have adversaries. They'll always have antagonists. Allah says in the Quran, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَا لِكُلِّ نَبِيٍ عَدُوًّا مِنَ الْمُجْرِمِينَ وَكَفَى بِرَبِّكَ هَادِيًا وَنَصِيرًا Allah says, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَا And like that, we have made for every prophet, لِكُلِّ نَبِيٍ عَدُوًّا Every Prophet Allah said we have made for them enemies. Min al mujrimina. And those enemies are who? The criminals. Wakafa bi rabbika hadiya wa nasira. Allah is enough to guide you and Allah is enough to give you victory. So the haq and the truth will always have enemy. That's inevitable. It's gonna happen. Whether you like it or not, it's the truth. Shaykh al-Islam. Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, his da'wah and the history behind his da'wah, many things have been said about it. People have spoken about it aggressively, some have defended it, and the claims that have been put regarding it are Al Khuruj, that they went against the Ottoman Empire, which we'll be speaking about extremism, that they're radical, that they done takfir of the Muslims, they label the Muslims as disbelievers, istibaha to dima, they permitted for themselves the blood of the people and they spilt blood, we'll speak about that, and other allegations, false allegations and accusations were put regarding the da'wah of the, the Imam, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. And the response to these allegations and these accusations were responded to. And it was responded by the imams of the da'wah themselves. They themselves, they took it upon themselves to respond to it. They debunked it. They dispelled it. They refuted it. 
and they proved that it was a false allegation, that it was all mere fictitious fallacies, arguments that weren't based on sound proofs, they themselves did it, rahimahumullah. And we'll show that as the series carries on, bi'idhnillah al kareem Anyone who goes out of his way now, who looks into the doubts that have been brought regarding the da'wah of Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, will find that it revolves around three. The doubts surrounding the da'wah of the Imam revolves generally, generally around three points. It revolves generally around three points. The first one is, شُبُهَاتٌ مُتَعَلِّقَةٌ بِأُصُولِ الدَّعْوَةِ الْإِصْلَاحِيَّةِ Doubts regarding and pertaining to the foundation in which the da'wah of Muhammad ibn Abdul Hab was built on. Like Tawheed and like adhering the concept of monotheism and also the concept of following the Messenger alayhi salatu So they've their doubt and their shubuhat is regarding the meaning of La ilaha illallah and the meaning of Muhammad Rasulullah. What does it mean? So they open doubts regarding the foundation and the base in which Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab's da'wah was built upon. The second doubts surrounding Al Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab's da'wah is. شُبُهَاتٌ مُتَعَلِّقَةٌ بِالتَّطْبِيقَاتِ الْعَمَلِيَّةِ لِلْدَعْوَةِ وَتَنْزِيلِ الْأَحْكَامِ الشَّرْعِيَّةِ عَلَى الْوَقَائِعِ الْعَمَلِيَّةِ The practical applications of the Imam of the Da'wah, Muhammad Abdul Wahab and his grandchildren, how they applied and how they exercised the Islamic jurisprudence and how they applied it in their surrounding and in their, and in their region such as, for instance, the, the destroying of uh, idols, the destroying of graves, um, the punishments uh, of those who uh, abandon the prayer, and their position regarding innovators and people who fall into innovation, how they apply those textual evidences from the Qur'an and the Sunnah in their, in their surrounding and in their uh, in their in their region, so that's the second type of doubts that have been uh, placed around the da'wah of Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. The third one is shubuhatun doubts muta'alliqatun doubts bimawqifi da'wati min al khusum doubts connected to the dealings of the a'imma of this da'wah, how they dealt with those who opposed them, their rivalries their adversaries, how were they towards them? And how did they deal with them? Whether they were individuals, whether they were uh, jama'at, groups, whether they were villages and towns and governments, how did they deal with them? How did they deal with the Ottoman Empire? How did they deal with the grave worshippers? How did they deal with the Sha'ira? How did they deal with the Sufiya at that time? The groups that were there, how was their dealing with those, with those uh, individuals and also those groups? That's the sec third uh, shubuhat, doubts surrounding the da'wah of an Imam Muhammad ibn al Abdul Wahab. If we go back to the first doubt that I mentioned, which is shubuhat, doubts regarding the usul of the da'wah al-Islahiyah, the foundations which Imam Muhammad Abdul Wahab's da'wah was built upon, the foundation, Tawheed, following the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that one, the A'imma of the da'wah have already responded to that. There were people who threw doubts at the da'wah of Imam Muhammad Abdul Wahab and what he was calling to and what he was preaching. And the Imam responded to them himself. And his grandchildren also responded to it. And the way that they responded to it was, it can be classified or it can be broken into or categorized into two main categories. The first one is, The way that they did it was, they just placed foundations. They placed principles, 
they put down uh, the evidences down, okay, without having to speak about uh, the doubts. They just focused on the the foundation and the principles for their da'wah. And a good example of that is Kitab al-Tawheed that Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab wrote. Kitab al-Tawheed is a book which is ta'siili and ta'qeedi. The Shaykh tries to put down foundations and he tries to also, rahimahullah, bring principles and evidences for his da'wah. The second way in which they dealt with this first shubha, shubha pertaining to their, the foundation of their da'wah, is to refute it. They refuted it uh, by bringing the doubt in their book and then responding to it. A prime example will be um, the Kitab Kashf al-Shubuhat, for instance. Kitab Kashf al-Shubuhat, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, he himself wrote it. And so what he did was he brings their doubts and he responds, it, responds to it in two ways. He responds it, uh, ijaba mujmala, a general response, and then he gives a ijaba mufassala. Uh, a, a, de- a detailed response. Also, uh, a book that went in that form and in that discourse is the Kitab Misbahu al Dalam fi Raddi ala man kadhaba ala Shaykh al Islam, written by Abdul Latif ibn Abdul Rahman ibn Hassan, where he refutes. Those who have lied about Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab and his da'wah. Another kitab is uh, the Minhaj al Ta'sis, the kitab Minhaj al Ta'sis wa Taqdis fi Kashfi Shubuhati Dawood ibn Jarjis. Abdul Latif again wrote this book, Abdul Latif ibn Abdul Rahman ibn Hassan ibn Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, where he debunks, he dispels, he responds to, he refutes. The doubts that have been brought, the doubts that have been brought regarding the da'wah of Imam Muhammad Abdul Wahab and the shubhat regarding the first of the three shubhas that I mentioned, which was doubts surrounded, um, surrounding uh, the usul of Imam Muhammad Abdul Wahab's da'wah, what it was built on. So those are the three primary uh, references, or the three primary sources that responded to these these issues of tawheed and what makes a person a muwahid and etc. and what does it mean following the messenger alayhi salatu wasalam and etc. As for the second two doubts that have been brought, in order to respond to it and in order to deal with it, a person has to have ilman bi amrayni. The person has to have insight, has to have knowledge of two things. The first one is ilman bi tarikhi da'wah. The person has to know the history of this da'wah. Have to understand the da'wah of Muhammad Abdul Wahab. His da'wah, his children's da'wah, you have to know the history behind it. You have to know the events that took place and what happened. You have to know it, especially how the da'wah started. And you also have to know the context, the situation, the surrounding, before the Imam came, after he came, and each event that had happened, the cause for it. The person has to have an understanding of all of that. In other words, the person has to have a correct perception of the history of the da'wah of Imam Muhammad Abdul Wahab and his grandchildren. The second thing is Imam bil ahkam al muta'aliqati bi tilka al The person has to have and knowledge of the Islamic rulings. And the person has to know the jurisprudent rulings, the ahkam of the sharia, the Islamic legal maxims, regarding those particular events that had happened. So once the person has the history and has the, uh, the perception and what took place and what happened, the person will need the Islamic background, Islamic knowledge, for what reason? So that they can place the correct ruling on those events and then see if Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab and his grandchildren did the right thing. The person who has the understanding of the Sharia and a correct knowledge of the religion is a person who's grounded in usul al-fiqh, it's a person who's grounded in al-aqidah, 
a person who's grounded in qawaid al fiqhia a person who knows the relationship between the dalil, the evidence, and the madlul, the thing that you're using the evidence for. A person who knows that. Not being able to understand those two, the historical events of the da'wah of Muhammad Abdul Wahab, and no Islamic background. If you lack both of those, you don't, ha you don't have the historical knowledge of what happened, and you don't have Islamic background, Islamic knowledge. If you lack both of those, then you would tend to disagree that with the da'wah of Imam Muhammad Abdul Wahab and his grandchildren. You will disagree with it. You will uh, speak against it, of course. And if you have knowledge of the Sharia, ah, you know the deen of Allah Azza wa Jalla, you know the jurisprudent rulings, you know usul al-fiqh, you've mastered that, you know qawaid al-fiqhiyah, you are a scholar in the religion, but you don't know the historical context of Imam Muhammad Abdul Wahab and what took place and what happened in the events and the region and the land that he was in. You don't know that. You'll also be unjust to the Imam. And this happened to two great scholars, Muhammad Shukri al-Alusi rahimahullah, Muhammad Shukri al-Alusi and Muhammad Ali Shawkani. Those two are great scholars when it comes to Islamic knowledge. They are great scholars. That, that goes without saying. They are two great noble scholars. But they lacked the knowledge of the tariq al-da'wah, the history of the da'wah of Imam Muhammad Abdul Wahab. They really didn't know it deeply. And so what they did was they criticized the da'wah of Imam Muhammad Abdul Wahab in some issues, even though they defended it. And they uh, Muhammad Shukri Alusi, for instance, he worked on the books of Imam Muhammad Abdul Wahab, like for example, the Kitab Masail al Jahiliya. You know, he has ta'liqat on it, and he, he was the one who brought it out from Iraq. And Muhammad, uh, Muhammad Ali al Shawkani from Yemen, also the same thing. He defended and he was one who pushed the da'wah of Imam Muhammad Abdul Wahab, but he criticized him also. And if you really look at the reason behind the criticism from these two great scholars, is not that they lacked Islamic knowledge. They had great knowledge in the religion. They had al imam bil al sharia They knew the Islamic rulings, Islamic jurisprudence. They knew that. They had that. But what they lacked was al imam bi tariq al-da'wah. They really didn't know in great details the history of the da'wah of al imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. So, you tend to find that the person will give an unfair judgment in this issue. Now I'm going to mention the three types, and I'm going to conclude with that for today, inshallah ta'ala, is that when it comes to Al-Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab's da'wah, and the da'wah of his grandchildren, you will find those who criticized it are three. They are three, and you won't find uh, a fourth. The first one is a person who is a historian. He's a mu'arikh. Al-Mu'tani bi tariq He's given consideration to history. He's, he's got very good understanding of history. And he has a good understanding. فَهُوَ مُلِمٌ بِتَارِيخِ الدَّعْوَةِ He studied the da'wah of Imam Muhammad Abdul Wahab deeply. He knows all the events. When they happen, what the year they happen, how they happen. He has great details of it. But he doesn't have Islamic knowledge. He doesn't know the religion. He's a historian. But he doesn't have al ilmam bil ahkam shariya He lacks that. And he doesn't have the ability, of course, to mention the Islamic rulings on these events that happened at the time of Muhammad Abdul Abdullah because he has no knowledge of the religion. So he can't. That individual, all he can really do is transmit and uh, bring forward the history of the Imam and the history of his grandchildren and what happened and the events. Like, and it's not for him and it's not his place to be honest, to criticize and pass judgments and rulings, rather Islamic judgments and Islamic rulings regarding what the Imam did. Not to mention, there were people who knew better history than any historian today. Because there, we're going to see, inshallah ta'ala, 
that Muhammad Abdul Wahab had people who he ascribed or a, a imam who he ascribed to write these events that when they were taking place. So it was scribed, it was scribed and it was written at the time of the imam himself and how everything happened. And we'll speak about the two good, the two big books, Ibn Ghannam and Ibn Bishr, his kitab, uh, and etc. We'll, we'll, we'll come to that, inshallah ta'ala, in the upcoming, in the upcoming uh, episodes, inshallah ta'ala. The second group of people are, he's a scholar. He has ilmam bil ahkam inshallah. They have, he has very good knowledge of the religion. He's a strong student of knowledge. And that's two types. I'm going to break the student of knowledge and the scholar into two types. A, he has good understanding of the ahkam of the sharia, knows the religion of Allah wa ta'ala, and he also even has correct, sound Islamic aqidah. His belief, his creed is sound. There's no problem with it. And so he agrees with the usul of the da'wah of Imam Muhammad al He agrees with him in tawheed. He agrees with him in uh, itiba' in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He also is grounded in usul al-fiqh, he's grounded in qawaid al-fiqhiyya and etc. And he even has tamakkun, he has the strength and the ability of doing inzal al-ahkam, to apply rulings in events and situations. He has that, and he can do that, uh, generally speaking. But he doesn't have the knowledge of the history that took place at the time of Muhammad Abdul Hab. He doesn't know that. He doesn't know the the events that happened, what took place, uh, he doesn't have knowledge of that. He lacks that. So he's grounded in the religion, but he's weak in the uh, uh, the waqai'ah, the events that took place and what had happened. But he's not ignorant of the, the ahkam of the religion, the rulings of the religion. The second type of student of knowledge or scholar is He's a scholar, he's a student of knowledge. He agrees with Ahl Sunnah in the Aqeedah. His Aqeedah is Aqeedah to Ahl Sunnah, generally. But there is this uh, concept of deviation that has entered him. Here or there, especially when we talk about concepts of Al Iman, he has fallen short in that issue in Mas'alatul Iman, what nullifies a person's Iman. And etc. So, maqalatul murji'a, the concept of the murji'a has kind of creeped into that person and he doesn't really know. So, because of that, because he has those concepts of irja' with him, you generally find he criticizes the da'wah of Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Hab, rahimahullah ta'ala. And he differs and he disagrees with him. Uh, the third type of people who criticize the da'wah of Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab are those who do not have any Islamic knowledge. They don't know anything about the deen of Allah Azza wa Jalla. They are ignorant. They are hamadur ra'a. They are from the general mass. They don't know anything. They are blind followers. إِذَا قَالَتْ حَذَامِي فَصَدِّقُوهَا فَإِنَّ الْقَوْلَ مَا قَالَتْ حَذَامِي they are just blind followers and they follow their group and their clique and their cult. Whatever they say, they are ignorant. And he also doesn't have he also doesn't have any knowledge of the history that took place. He doesn't know the da'wah of Muhammad Abdul Hab, how it started. He doesn't know what took place and what happened. And how it happened. And who it happened to. He doesn't know any of that. It's just that he took from his teachers, he took from those who he studied from, Wahhabism, uh, Wahhabis are bad people, and he goes around labeling everyone Wahhabi, 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 who differs with him. And these are the most. May Allah not make them the most, and not increase them in number. And these are min awamin nas, from the general mass. They are from the general mass. So it's important that we understand all of this, so when we go into the silsila, when we go into the series that we're going to start uh, next lesson, inshallah ta'ala, that you truly understand uh, those types of people and where the problem is occurring from. Uh, as I said to you, it's going to be 12 parts, including this one. It's going to be 12 parts in general, inshallah ta'ala, where we will, inshallah ta'ala, bring to light the da'wah of this imam and the da'wah of his children, 
and allow the listeners and those who are watching to be upon clarity of who this man was. Anything I might have said that was wrong or incorrect is from me, Shaytan, and Allah and His Messenger are free from it. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik, ashadu wa la ilaha illallah, astaghfiruka tubulik.